Good morning, church. Um, today's um, scripture reading is coming from Romans 12, verses 10 to 13. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Amen. In honor, giving preference to one another. Yes. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Here in the word, reading of the word. Amen. Amen. I don't want to really sound overly critical at the beginning of the sermon, but I need to say good afternoon to you. Bonnie and David are downstairs, and they're already wondering how much I'm editing. But that's okay. Ashley, thank you for that music. I always feel humble after hearing a voice like that, and I go, now what am I supposed to do? <clears throat> Let's say we can take that page. Up. No, no, I'm just kidding. Story goes, there's a farmer. I always like stories about farmer because I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Not much growing in Detroit, Michigan. Anymore, there's not many people left in Detroit, Michigan. So when I was a brand new second lieutenant, the first secretary I had, Mary Miller, her husband was a farmer. So I didn't know anything about farming, so I said, can I go out and see your farm? Sure. He was harvesting wheat at the time. I don't know if you know anything about harvesting wheat, but there's this tractor that cuts it, and this other machine kind of kind of puts it in a bale. It comes out the chute, and there has to be a person that kind of is at the end of the chute that gets the bale and puts it on the trailer in a sequence that theoretically maximizes space. So Mary's husband says, why don't you try stacking the bales of hay for me? And he actually said it with a straight face. Sure, I'm a lieutenant, I can do anything. So he's driving very slowly, and the first bale comes, and if you've seen bales, it had these strings, you pick it up, and you move to the back, and you put it in position, and you come back, and the bale was already there. That's okay, I'll get it. And so now I have to hurry up. And so in one of the times when I hurried up and I turned to come back to the front to get the next two bales that were there, I fell off the tractor which he thought was rather funny. I didn't see the humor in it at all. But he and Mary Miller thought that was funny, and he won the bet. Apparently, he and his wife bet that he could get me to fall off the trailer. <laughs> she got a really a bad performance evaluation that year, and I felt okay. <laughs> Not true. She'll listen to Kurt's story, huh? <laughs> the story goes, <laughs> a farmer hires a worker. A lot of tasks around the farm. The farmer says, your first task is I want you to paint the barn. It should take you about three days. The worker says, okay. He's finished painting the barn in a day and a half. Farmer's kind of impressed. Okay, not bad. See that pile of wood over there? I want it chopped into usable pieces for the fireplace. Should take you about a day. Helper says, okay, no problem. At lunch, he goes to the farmer. He says, what's next? Farmer's kind of impressed with this man's efficiency and his effectiveness. So he says, see that pile of potatoes over there we just harvested? Yes. I want them sorted into three piles. I want a pile of seed potatoes that we're going to use to plant. I want a pile of potatoes that we're going to use to feed the animals. And I want a third pile. These are the best potatoes, the ones that only the best can go in this third pile because we're going to sell them at the market. Should take you a couple days. 
The next morning, the farmer shows up, sees the worker just sitting, doing nothing. Then he looks at the pile of potatoes. Hasn't changed a lick from when he gave him the assignment yesterday. He goes up and says, hey, the barn was a snap. The wood was a snap. What's wrong with the potatoes? Helper says, I can work hard. I can work fast. I just can't make decisions. <laughs> okay, go ahead, say it. I'm not say oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I love watching the Holy Spirit put a worship together. <laughs> Making decisions is not easy. Any of you who face decisions like Sean probably did at his work the other day that he was a little overwhelmed with, know that making good decisions doesn't come easy. Some of you who are historians know that Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of England during the most of World War II. You might also know that the military intelligence, which is an oxymoron, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Hope you folks are comfortable. This is just the intro. <laughs> the military intelligence people broke the German military code. They used the term ultra to describe the broken military code. Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, the leader of the Kingdom of Great Britain, was told through the broken German military code that the city of Covington would be bombed in two days. You're the Prime Minister, you have information that Lawrenceville is going to be wiped out in a bombing raid Monday evening. If he tells the people in Lawrenceville to get out, he will also have told the Germans, we have broken your code. His choice was to save the city or save the information access through the broken German code. Making decisions is not easy. Luckily, God has given us the Bible. And today, we're going to use the story of Abraham and Lot, at least the beginning of the story of Abraham and Lot, to look at how God wants you and I to make decisions. Maybe we won't have to decide whether or not to save a city, but all of us face decisions from day to day, hour to hour, moment to moment. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to use Abraham and Lot as the teaching tools that the Holy Spirit's going to provide to help us understand how to make difficult decisions. And I'm going to tell you the bottom line up first, because according to Dale, some of you downstairs are already asleep. Don't be ashamed if you're down there napping. Some of us up here are already asleep. And I'm sure there's one or two at home that have turned me off and went back to taking a nap. When we talk about lay activities, that never mind. No. Genesis chapter 13 is where I want you to be. Look with me in Genesis 13 verse 5. Genesis 13, 5, Lot also, who went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and another group of people also dwelt in the land. Lot... The nephew of Abraham, the leader of the clan, had flocks and herds and tents. 
that's the currency of the day. They didn't have master cards and you know, all that stuff. They had animals and possessions. Abraham was just as rich as Lot was. It was a toss-up on who had most. And because of the plenty that God had given these two men, the land couldn't handle the flocks. Too many animals, too little grass, too little water. And oh, by the way, there were already two groups of people living on the land. Now, you need to understand that those who were already there probably didn't welcome the foreigners, Abraham and Lot, with open arms. As ranchers, they probably knew that the land was already pretty close to its max capacity of supporting animals, and we don't need your 200 animals, thank you very much. So the newcomers come, and there's some conflict between these two men and their camps. Those who are already there are going to enjoy the show because they're going to watch how Abraham and Lot work through the conflict. As God's church, we need to understand that those people out there love watching us because they know we have the same conflicts they do. Satan makes sure of that. So conflict resolution is a really a critical skill if we're going to be the church God wants us to be, if we're going to be the lighthouse God put us here to be. So we better figure out how to make good decisions, how to avoid bad decisions, so we present the right image to the community. Genesis 13, verse 8. So Abraham said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between me and you and between our herdsmen and our herd, my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. If not the whole, is not the whole land before, before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Abraham is sensitive to the conflict that is brewing. He doesn't want it to fester and really become an issue. So he pulls a lot and says, hey, let's get this figured out. Now, if you understand the story, which one of those two is the superior and which one of those two is the junior? Abraham is the senior. He's the guy in charge. He's the guy God made the promise to. Abraham's just the tag along. Lot. Thank you. I'm glad someone's listening. <laughs> Abraham's in charge. Lot is the tag along. Who should have gotten first choice? Abraham. Abraham. It's the way the rules are written. I'm in charge. I get first pick. You get whatever's left. That's the human system. Lot goes, hmm, I don't think I'm going to use the human system. I'm a friend of God. Why don't I do it his way? So he taps into some divine wisdom. The same wisdom you and I can tap into. It's in James chapter 3. We're coming back, so don't lose your place. James chapter 3, look with me at verse 17. This is the wisdom that Abraham bases his conflict resolution on. James chapter 3, verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Abraham had every legal right to pull rank and tell Lot to stay in your place. If you have to, sacrifice your cattle. I don't care. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. And yet he knows that's not how God operates. From a human perspective, Abraham had every right to demand his legal rights. But he also knew that God 
likes gracious people. And so he acts on God's system and not on man's system. So he turns to his nephew and says, okay, second lieutenant, why don't you pick what you think you need to do and I'll do the other thing. Abraham is making a decision on spiritual principles when Lot looks out at the valley he's thinking in human materialistic I can just see him grinning from ear to ear as he goes wow this is a cool place and I get any of it I want he might even start drooling because he's so excited Lot seems preoccupied with the material aspects of the decision. Abraham makes his decision on spiritual principles. The cause of Lot's bad decision is in Genesis 13, verse 10. Lot lifts his eyes and sees all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and we'll get to there some Sabbath soon. And because it was watered everywhere, it was like a garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zor. Remember, Abraham and Lot just came from Egypt because they went there because of the food. Lot saw the plain of Jordan was a really good place for his cattle to multiply. All the water that they need, all the food that they need. Verse 11, then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. Lot looked at the place, where can I make the most money? Where will my cattle be the greatest fed, and where is the most water? In our terms, he was thinking, what's in it for me? That's our modus operandi, usually, as a culture of making decisions. What can I get out of this? What benefits in it for me? We saw Abraham used a different criteria for making his decisions. But Lot is into the material. He's thinking of, how do I use this opportunity to prosper for myself. No evidence do we have that he ever stopped to think of the spiritual implications of his decision. Didn't even enter his thinking process. And unfortunately, there are many Christians today who act a lot like Lot. Okay, I got to play Christian for a couple hours on the weekends, but then I can get back to making some money. Okay, I did what I had to do. I even paid a tithe. They gave some money to the church. But now I'm back in the world of business. And I make my decisions on how I'm going to maximize my opportunity. Now, you need to understand that in Genesis 13, this is the first experience we have with financial issues in the Bible. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with being rich. Now, it is true God loves poor people more he must, because there's more of us. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with wealth. Okay, if you were here for Lydia, where's Lydia? Lydia's Sabbath school class, she read with you 1 Timothy 6.10. Money isn't the root of all evil. It is the love of money that gets you into trouble. Abraham was just as wealthy as Lot. Lot was just as wealthy as Abraham. But Abraham seems to have had the wealth. In Lot's case, it seems like the wealth had it Lot. The emphasis is on the wrong syllable. Lot was aware of God's word, and he was aware of the promise given, given to Abraham but his concern appears to be on the material. And he acts on what he thinks 
will get him the best material advantage and apparently ignores the spiritual impact. The same opportunity is out there today. Find Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 is a parable or two. I'm going to look with you at verse 22. The parable of the sower is explained by Jesus. And in verse 22, he talks about one of the kinds of soils that he just talked about. Verse 22, Jesus says, Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Abraham made decisions on spiritual things. Lot knew the spiritual things, but the desire for material wealth choked out God's word. And he made a different choice with what he wanted to do. Lot made a bad decision. He went to the plain of Jordan. He separates himself from Abraham, which was the solution Abraham thought would work. He separates himself from the influence of Abraham in his life. Back in Genesis 13, look with me at verse 12. Abraham dwells in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Sodom was a wicked place. You'll learn more about that in weeks to come. And Lot is flirting with danger by going there. Now, this is not a sermon about tempting God. But only the foolish go, hey, Lord, I'm going to go to Las Vegas. Protect me as I'm at the craps table. That's <laughs> what Lot's doing. But I want you to notice the sequence of steps Lot takes in the verses we just read. First, he lifts his eyes and sees the plane, and it appears to be good. Man has all that water and the grass, and my cattle can grow and multiply, and I'll be richer. This is going to be good. Then he kind of takes steps to go towards the city. Verse 12. And finally, he pitches his tent as far as Sodom. He used to be in the clan with Abraham, watching Abraham, learning from Abraham, being influenced by Abraham, and he ends up in Sodom. Now, God can do miraculous things, but he also kind of expects us to have some common sense. My guess is Lot never intended to get into pagan territory as deeply as he did. I mean, when he's standing next to Abraham, looking over, trying to figure out what he's going to do, I guarantee you, in his mind, it's going, oh, good, I get to live in Sodom. This is going to be fun. That's not in his mind, and yet that's what happens when you make bad decisions. The devil helps us get into our own pit of sin one small step at a time. How many people know the story of how to boil a frog? Okay, if I do this wrong, correct me. If you want to cook a frog, you do not get the boiling water first and then put the frog in. Because the frog will go, ooh, this is hot. I'll jump out. Don't get ahead of me in the story. I had to inhale there. Matter of fact, I'll have some water. No, never mind. The way you burn the frog or cook the frog is you put the frog in the water. Frog goes, oh, this is nice. Frogs like being in water. Then you slowly turn the heat up. And if you turn up the heat gradually enough, he'll stay in there until he gets cooked. Now, if Satan can do that to a frog. What do you think he can do to you and me? 
Lot didn't intend to get into trouble. He just made a bad decision. And Satan capitalized on that to get him to a place that Lot never intended to be. The cause of Lot's bad decision was his desire for financial prosperity at the cost of the spiritual implications. The sinful plain of Jordan looked really appealing, seemed good for a season. Lot sows his seeds of greed and he ends up reaping a whirlwind. So now let's contrast Lot's bad decision. Back to Genesis 13. I'm in verse 14. And the Lord said to Abraham after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I give you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and width, for I give it to you. Abraham is an unselfish follower of God. He lets the subordinate make the choice of what the subordinate thinks he wants. Abraham's unselfishness, apparently according to what we just read, was pretty impressive to God, and God blessed him for acting the appropriate way. Lot makes his decision without any help from God, purely on what's best for me. Abraham, this time, last week he didn't do this, this time he waits on God to tell him what to do. Lot made his choice and he goes and does his thing. Abraham's still standing there. He had learned from the experience in Egypt. <laughs> like, okay, I'll wait. <laughs> I think I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm waiting. And God tells him, God tells him that all the land that he sees is his. It's going to be his descendants forever. And his descendants are going to be like the dust in my bedroom. Well, sorry, I mean dust of the world. I'm sure I'm going to get that because she's taking notes back in the corner. It's okay. Some of you are still working on that. It's okay. The lesson is God's arithmetic is different than man's arithmetic. The world says you gain by taking what is yours and some of what isn't yours. Investing it, holding it, swindling other people out of theirs, and you acquire and acquire, and pretty soon you'll have the wealth. God's arithmetic works really kind of strange for us humans. God's arithmetic says you gain by losing, and you go, what? Matthew back chapter 19 this time. Matthew chapter 19, look with me at verse 29. Jesus says in Matthew 19, 29, and anyone, or everyone, sorry, who has left homes or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or lands, for my sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. I can just see this being taught at the you know, prestigious MBA course. You're going to increase your wealth by giving it away. That professor would be fired immediately unless he worked for God. Because in God's system, you gain by giving away. Through faith, Abraham understood that principle. He willingly gives up what is legally, rightfully his, the first choice. And God is pleased and promise him, promises him again that he would populate the world. He would have lots of land and things would be well. 
God is pleased when his children have and demonstrate faith. It's easy to have belief. It's harder to have faith. Belief is an intellectual understanding of what this book says. Faith is when you put that belief to practice. Like, okay, I don't understand how 90% of my salary is going to be more than 100%, but God says it, so we'll do it. That's faith. God's arithmetic is not the world's arithmetic. And when God sees his children, like Abraham, be faithful, God will, in his own time, bless faith and obedience. So in response to God's command, notice what Abraham did. We're back in Genesis 13. We've made it all the way to verse 18. Abraham moves his tent, went and dwelt by some trees, some place which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Now if you're with me, Abraham and Lot are standing together. They know it ain't going to work with all those cattle out there on the pasture because there are already people out there on the pasture with their cattle. So Abraham says, Lot, make your choice. Take whatever you want. Lot chooses what he thinks is going to help him materialistically. Abraham says, okay, I'm waiting on the Lord. The Lord says, go that way. Walk wherever you want. It's yours. People will multiply. It'll really be good. Lot goes to Sodom. Abraham goes to where God tells him to. And when Abraham gets to where God tells him to do, he builds an altar. Amen. Amen. If you're with me last week, you know this is his third altar. I mean, we only know this guy for two weeks, and he's built three altars already. Amen. The other two are back in Genesis 12. Altars, as you remember from last week, are really important to Abraham because that's where he builds upon the faith he has, so he has more faith. You and I should have an altar. We talked about that last week, and I also told you last week that these other two altars that Abraham has left somewhere along the trail are used by the non-Jewish people to build their faith in the God of heaven. There is a really a powerful description of what happens when God's children follow God's advice. Just as a fact, because I know you care, this is my very first sermon I preached on my birthday in 1996. In one sense, that seems like only yesterday. In other senses, I've aged 30 years since then. But turn to Psalms 1. The first psalm in the book of Psalms says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Notice that's a progression right there. First he walks with the bad guys. Then he stands around talking with them. Finally, he sits down and has a powwow with them so they can really give him the information. But, verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law, in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf will not wither, and whatever he does, he shall prosper. Who is the person that walked in the counsel of the ungodly in our story. Lot. He made choices based on non-spiritual principles. Lot goes, okay, I learned this lesson last week. I'm waiting until the God that I serve tells me what I'm supposed to do. And Abraham does what his heavenly father tells him what to do. You and I, don't need to follow the instructions like we're slaves and you know, he's the master and he's going to zap us with a lightning bolt if we don't do what we're told. 
We need to understand that the instructions are there because God loves us enough. He wants our best outcome of this life. So he gives us the instructions that he knows will work if we only will work what he tells us to do. Abraham had that figured out. Lot apparently didn't. Now at the uh, risk of offending Gene, who's retired and he has lots of time to analyze my sermon, so I've got to be careful here. <laughs> Educators, like the Holy Spirit, use two approaches to help the students, us, learn. They provide us examples of what should be done. They provide us non-examples of what should not be done. In today's presentation, you got both of those from God. Abraham is the example of how you and I should make decisions based on spiritual principles. Lot is the non-example. He's in the story to tell us how not to do it. Here are the four reasons Lot did what he did and the four things you're not to do. Lot was greedy and based his decision on personal financial gain. Uh oh. Do I? Lot was greedy and based his decision on personal financial gain. I'm going that way because that has all the water in the grass and it'll be good for my cattle. Second, Lot chose the way of immediate gratification while neglecting the long-term spiritual ramifications. Man, look at all the grass and the water. My cattle are going to be happy today. Oh, I don't care that I end up living in Sodom. I'll deal with that later. Third, Lot had no altar where he could seek the will of God and grow in his faith. Abraham, when he followed God's principles, said, Okay, God, I'm right where you want me to be. Uh, here's an altar where you and I can commune some more. Lot didn't have that. Fourth, Lot had learned nothing from going to Egypt. Last week, Abraham did what he thought was right, and God had to correct that little oversight. Abraham apparently learned from that experience. Lot, woo! He missed that lesson altogether. So, when you leave here soon, you're going to face some more decisions in your life. I suggest you follow Abraham's example and you stay away from Lot's demonstrated failure. Now, that's easily said, not as easily done. But we should stop and remember the story of Abraham and Lot. You don't have to know all the details. But you should know that Abraham, the friend of God, based his decisions on spiritual principles. Lot didn't. And you'll hear some more of the interesting things that Lot got to experience because of his ill-advised decision. You and I can follow Abraham's example because he's a friend of God and we can follow Abraham's example by leaning on the everlasting arms of God, which is our closing hymn, hymn number 469. And Kirk is looking for his co-chorister. <laughs> Let's all stand as we sing. Four sixty-eight. Four sixty-nine. Thank you. What a fellowship! What a joy divine! Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessed peace! What a peace is mine! Leaning on the everlasting arms. Safe and secure.
Leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Last verse. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? On the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning. Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that the Holy Spirit will help us understand and apply the lessons that you have in store for us, that we will make decisions that are pleasing in your eyes, decisions that you can use to advance your kingdom and bring glory to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.